with you. Wherever you are right now, let God hear your voice. We're going to worship and start with follow you anywhere. Park Valley. I'm Pastor Paul. Do you know that sharing a story of your journey of faith is often the best way to spread the gospel? 
Today, I'd like to share a story of my journey with all of you, a short story. It's a story of faith and of answered prayer. When I started out in ministry about two decades ago, I started in a Christian counseling ministry where I had to raise support. And so I was relying on, on people's generosity for me to have a paycheck. I was bivocational, meaning that I still hung on to my, my, my job. Although it was full-time with FedEx, I'd gone part-time as a courier. So each morning I'd go to FedEx and then I'd end up at the ministry and I would be trusting uh, the generosity of people to really provide for a paycheck. So. Um, have you ever had a car uh, that was on the verge of death at any moment? That was my car at the time. And so um, I, I was talking to my boys about it. I said, you know, they would say, what's going to happen when your car dies, Dad? And I said, we're going to trust God to provide for us when the need arises. They didn't know exactly know what that meant, and neither did I, to tell you the truth. Um, but that day soon approached. It was a New Year's Eve morning. I was driving into my FedEx work, and uh, sure enough, the car decided that halfway to work, uh, that was the life of the car. And so I got a buddy to pick me up, did my part-time shift that day. It was New Year's Eve morning, so we had had plans for a New Year's Eve party with the families from our church. Uh, so my wife picked me up, we're driving back home, and she's like, the Lord's gonna provide, right? Like, yeah, we're truly trusting God to provide for us. and. Uh, Got home and we were getting ready to go to the celebration. Got a call from a friend who said, are you gonna be home for a little while? And I said, yeah, we're gonna be here for a little while. He goes, got something to bring you. He drove into my cul-de-sac and his brother drove in behind him with a pickup truck. Do you know that those guys arrived in two vehicles and left in one? The pickup truck was a gift for me. The brother had decided to sell his truck, and when he couldn't find the right price, he decided to donate it to a ministry. So he called his brother, who said, I know of a family that needs this, this very thing. And so um, it was an amazing story of, um, of provision, of answered prayer. More importantly, it was a testimony of God's faithfulness. Here's my boys sitting next to me, and they watched this truck pull up after hearing their dad pray that the Lord would provide in, their, in his time of need. And so um, what ends up being, that becomes a part of my story that I share. It's not my story, but it's my testimony that I get to share with people about how great God is. And in sharing that story, I find from time to time that a lot of people have a truck story, a time when God showed up in a miraculous way, use that in a way to share how wonderful God is and how he provides for our needs. I'd like to pray with you this morning about just that. Would you join me? Father God, we thank you for your love and your provision. We thank you for the way that you show up in powerful ways. May you be glorified in all the miraculous things you do in answered prayer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hi everyone, my name is Tana. Thank you so much for being here today. Last weekend, we reopened our elementary, underground, and vertical services, and we look forward to worshiping together again this week. Elementary services will occur during normal service hours. Underground meets on Tuesdays from 6 to 7.30, and vertical will meet on Wednesdays from 6 to 7.30 p.m. As a reminder, we ask that all students, 10 and older, please wear a mask, and if you don't have one, we will be happy to provide you with one. We look forward to seeing you there. Celebrate Recovery is back. We meet every Thursday in the kids' auditorium. Pizza will be served at 6 and worship at 7. There will be no childcare available at this time. Thank you so much for your generosity. Your giving allows us to impact our community for Jesus. We have multiple ways that you can give. You can give in person, through our drop boxes, through our website, through the app, or you can text PVC Give to 77977. Thank you for being a part of what God is doing here at Park Valley Church. Hey, thank you so much for being a part of our services and, you know, for weeks and weeks and weeks um, connecting with us online. I can't thank you enough for doing that. Thank you for your generosity. Um, the church has been giving very, very faithfully. Um, if you are, you know, regularly giving tithes and offerings to Park Valley Church, even though we're not meeting here, can I just say thank you? Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your sacrifice. Um, it is helping keep this church going. And it means a lot. And, and in, you know, consequently, we're able to help an awful lot of people. Um, we've been able to help probably to the tune of about $100,000 an awful lot of people when it comes to food or rent or 
car payments or utility bills or whatever. And it's just been, this church has been such a huge blessing to this community during this time. I also want you to know that we are meeting right now. You know, we're continuing our online because there's an awful lot of people that don't feel comfortable coming back yet, but we are, we are able to meet at 50% capacity. And so right now, currently we are offering um, in-person worship services at Park Valley Church, 50% capacity. A lot of people are thinking, I don't want to take a seat because I know a lot of people are going to go. Can I just say this? Not a lot of people are coming. Um, we got plenty of room. Uh, there's plenty of room. I mean, I, m- I remember one day I was preaching and I looked over to my left and there was like one person in that whole section. <laughs> they were socially distanced. That wasn't a problem. Um, so we've got plenty of room. If you feel comfortable coming back, we'd love to have you come back. We're doing our first through fifth grade um, program and those kids are socially distanced and the leaders are wearing masks and we're actually doing refreshments. We're doing donuts and coffee and uh, pizza. And so all that stuff's back. And, you know, we're obviously taking precautions with everything. But, you know, we're excited to be meeting again. I just wanted to let you know that I find that people are in typically three spots. Either they're, they didn't know we were meeting or they um, are a little bit, you know, just uncomfortable with meeting right now because of the, you know, COVID-19. Or they're just loving the fact that they can have church in their living room whenever, whenever they want to have it. You know, so you know, I get it. People are in three different camps, but I wanted to let you know, I'm hoping one day we can get back to normal and that we can start having our crowds here and just worshiping God together, you know, uh, right here, you know, at at our church building. But we're starting a brand new series and the series is just simply called The Blessing because I figured if there was an, if there was a time when people need the blessing of God in their life, it's now when there's a pandemic uh, worldwide, when there is unrest in our nation, when there's so much division and hatred and spite in our nation right now, and hurt, not just spite, but hurt, uh, you know, just all through the, the country, when we need unity now more than ever, I thought it would be good just to take a month and talk about the blessing of God. What I want more than anything else is I want God's blessing on my life personally. I want pe- the people that come in contact with this church to be blessed and I want them to have the blessing of God in their life. And, you know, I've always thought to myself, I want this to be, this church to be a healing place. And when, when people come to Park Valley, I want healing to take place. You know, I know you're probably thinking, what are you, you're going crazy on us. I just, I want people to be healed, you know. And I'm not talking just physical, but I want physical healing too. We pray to the same God of the Old Testament, same God of the New Testament, same God who has the power to heal anybody, anytime, anywhere of any illness. And I pray that God heals people physically, emotionally, mentally, um, spiritually, especially spiritually. And so we want the people that get connected with this ministry to be blessed, you know, and that's something that, that we all want. You know, when it comes to my own personal life, I want the blessing of God in my life. And one of the reasons, you know, because I desire God's hand on my life and his blessing on my life, I think it honestly, it leads me into a lot of struggle. And sometimes I feel a little bit like what Paul was talking about in Romans 7, where he says, you know, all the stuff I want to do, I don't do. And all the stuff I don't want to do, I do. And, you know, there's this battle that goes on in my heart between the two different natures I have. I've got a sin nature that I was born with, but I got a new nature when I gave my life to Jesus. And so those two things are constantly, those two natures are constantly struggling you know, with each other. And so the fact that I crave God's hand on my life, the fact that I crave his direction, the fact that I crave his blessing, um, honestly just leads me into more struggle because I know the same time I crave his blessing, at any moment I could do something or be involved in something that could ruin my testimony, ruin my ministry, ruin my family, ruin my marriage. And so there's, there's this constant struggle that goes on. I mean, honestly, there is an enemy who has a full-time job who's trying to do everything to make sure that all of those things happen in my life in a negative way. And yet I still crave, you know, the blessing of God. I'm the type of person that believes the verse that says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. And I'm also the type of person that believes the exact opposite of it, that I can't do anything without his strength. I can't do anything without his hand. I can't do anything without his blessing. I can't do nothing without him. 
So I have to have him in my life. And as a pastor, and I'm not playing the smallest violin in the world, but it's going to sound like it to some people, but as a pastor, even more so, because you're constantly preaching the word of God and trying to be an example. And, 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 and I still struggle with all of these different things in my life. And so, you know, I, I need it. I just need, I need the hand of God in my life. I'm saved. I know it. I'm going to heaven. I know it. But I want his blessing now. I want him to bless my marriage. I want him to bless my kids. I want him to bless my ministry. I want him to bless my health. And I believe that God will do those things. You know, I honestly believe it. And, and again, hence the struggle. And I, and I don't think it's a coincidence that we have stories in the Bible about, you know, people like Jacob. I mean, you read about Jacob in his life. His life is filled with struggle. Here's a man who pretty much his entire life craves spiritual things, craves the blessing of God, craves the hand of God in his life. He just kind of goes all, you know, at it the wrong way. Like, for example, when it came to the birthright, he basically swindled his brother Esau out of his birthright with a bowl of stew. And, you know, Esau basically gave up his rights as the firstborn child to Jacob for a bowl of food. It doesn't even make any sense. But you know what? Jacob had a desire for that. Jacob wanted that. He swindled his brother out of it, which was the wrong way of going about it. But he had a desire for spiritual things. You know, it's the same thing when it came to the blessing. I know that sounds like a movie, the blessing. But, you know, I know that when it came to the blessing that he was going to get from his father, he and his, and his mother, Rebecca, you know, got together and cheated Esau out of the blessing from Isaac, their father, right before Isaac died. Why? Because Rebecca and Jacob craved blessing. They craved it. They went about it the wrong way. A hundred percent. Absolutely. You know, and then Jacob ended up, having, ended up having to run for his life because Esau wanted to kill him. And I don't blame Esau. You know, uh, that was a pretty low thing for him to do. Stole his birthright, stole his blessing, and then skipped town. And, you know, but, but God's hand was on him. Even because of, even in spite of all of that, when Jacob is on his way to go hang out with Laban, his uncle, and live there, you know, he camps out in a particular place. And while he camps out, puts his head on a stone, which is crazy, but goes to sleep and all of a sudden sees this staircase or ladder or whatever staircase really that went from earth all the way up to heaven. And he saw angels ascending and descending on the staircase. And at the top of the staircase, he saw the presence of God. You know, and basically he hears the God of the universe say, man, I'm the God of your grandfather and the God of your father and the God of you. And everything I promised them, I'm going to do for you. And I'm going to go with you and I'm going to protect you and I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to give you everything I said that I would give you. And you know what? Jacob was absolutely blown away. He said, this is Bethel. This is Bethel. And the reason he called it Bethel is because he says, God is in this place. He said, this is the house of God. This is where God is, you know? And so God was with him. And when he moved to do basically 14 years of hard labor with his uncle Laban to earn two wives, which I don't recommend, obviously, it's not a good thing, but to earn two wives. And, and, but, but through that entire 14 year period under Laban's thumb, God miraculously blessed him, just put his hand on him. And anytime they had an agreement when it came to, you know, the livestock or whatever, every, you know, you know, animal that was born was, you know, basically to the specifications that would go with Jacob's, you know, wealth. So Jacob was constantly getting wealthier and wealthier. God's hand was on him. I'm not, I'm not saying that when God's hand is on you, you'll be wealthy. I'm not saying that. You know, I'm just saying in this particular case, you can see the hand of God because he was expanding Jacob's influence. He was expanding his wealth. He was expanding his, his power. And at the end of 14 years, Jacob finally went to, to Laban and he basically said, I'm done. I don't want to be here anymore. I want to have my own house, my own place. I want to be my own man. And he says, I'm, I'm leaving. And Laban said something that he, I heard even as a kid, even as a kid, it hit me in the heart. And basically, Laban says this, he says, please listen to me. I've become wealthy for the Lord has blessed me because of you. You know what? I, every time I hear that verse, 
Even as a kid growing up, I thought, wow, it must be, it must be cool to be in a position in your life where God has his hand on you so much, where he blesses you so much that everybody that comes in contact with you gets blessed because they, because they're near you. I always thought to myself, I want to be that guy. I want to be that guy. I want God's hand on my life. I want God's blessing in my life. You know, and I want it all my life so much that people that come in contact with me, people that are in, in, in associations with me also are blessed because of the hand of God on my life. And I know maybe that sounds weird. Maybe it sounds selfish. I don't know what it sounds like, but I know I want it. You know, I know that's something I want in my life. And for Jacob, it didn't stop there. He still craved blessing. He craved blessing. When he left Laban, he was on his way back to his home and he heard that Esau, his brother, was coming. And so he was, a, was fearful and he split up the, his, his people and his servants and his family and his livestock and, split, and created a gift for Esau and did all these different things. And at a moment in the camp when, one night when he was alone, the Bible says that a man came and wrestled with him. You know who it was? It was God, it was God in flesh. And the cool thing about it was Jacob knew it. He knew it because after the conflict, he said, this is Peniel. I'm going to call this place Peniel because I saw the face of God and didn't die. He knew that even to be exposed to the face of Almighty God would be certain death. He's that holy. He's that righteous. He's that powerful. He's that amazing. And, and yet he didn't die. So I'm going to call this place Peniel. So he knew it was God and he kept wrestling with him and wrestling with him. It was this struggle for a blessing. I know what it's like. Sometimes I feel like I wrestle with God. Sometimes I feel like I wrestle with both of my natures and, and temptation and wanting to be used of God in the ministry and wanting to have a strong family and being an example and wanting to quit at times and just all these different things that just pile up into your brain. It's this struggle, but, but the foundation of it is more than anything else, I want the hand of God on my life and I want the blessing of God on my life. And Jacob basically says, I'm not gonna let you go. The person just kept saying, let me go. Jacob said, I'm, never, I'm not gonna let you go. I will not quit. I will never quit. And he didn't. Then you know what the stranger did? Touched his hip, pulled his hip out of joint. I don't know if you've ever had hip pain. I've had hip pain before. It was so bad I, could, I couldn't even walk. It was so bad I couldn't even sit down. I was screaming in pain. And yet even in all of the pain that he went through after the stranger, who was God in the flesh, touched his hip, put it out of, out of socket, he would not let him go. He said, let me go. He said, I will not let you go until you bless me. You know, I think there are going to be times in life when you got to want it. You got to want the hand of God on your life because the enemy is so stinking present. You know, you got to want it. You got to want to hang in there and say, I will not quit. I will not stop going after the hand of God. I will not stop going after the blessing of God in my life. I will not do it. And the stranger looks at Jacob, it was God in the flesh and said, what's your name? Understand this. Anytime God asks a question, he's not asking a question because he needs an answer. He's ask, asking a question because he need, he's trying to make a point. He looks at Jacob and, and in a sense, in our vernacular, he looks at him and he says, who are you? Who are you? And in my opinion, as far as the way I translate it, and that's just me, that's what God does in my heart. When he says, I'm Jacob, he's looking at the stranger and he's saying this, I'm a cheater. I'm a thief. I'm a swindler. You know what? I'm a supplanter. You know, I'm always going after this and that, and I'm doing it in dishonest and, and, and sinister ways and scheming. I'm a schemer, basically, is what he was saying. And that's when God basically looks at him and he says, not anymore, you're not. I'm going to tell you this. The struggle changes you. It changes you as a person. Anytime you go through a deep valley in your life, it grows you and it strengthens you and it matures you and it changes you. And I think, sorry to get up emotional, but I think up to that point, Jacob had been through so much. I mean, we could spend an hour going through all the stuff that Jacob had been through. And he had seen the hand of God. 
He had seen the miracle working hand of God on his life absolutely over and over again. But you know, he had been through a lot. And I just love the fact that even in the struggle, when it got to be the greatest, he would not relent. He would not quit. And I think all of us, when the pain gets unbearable, we need to sometimes even just say it out loud. I will not quit. When you feel exhausted, when you are so exhausted, you need to just say, I will not quit. I want the blessing of God over the pleasures of sin. I want the, I want the, the, the abundant benefit of God, because that's what blessing means. I want the abundant benefit of God over the pleasures of sin for a season. That's what I want. I'm not quitting. I'm not throwing in the towel. When the temptation is right in front of you, you make the choice to say, I'm going to be faithful and I'm going to serve the Lord no matter what, because I know that God's got a blessing for me. Even when I feel like I'm alone, God's got a blessing for me. God's going to change me. I probably bring up Alex Green almost every other message. It's a 13-year-old kid that wrecked my life. And I still think about him on a regular basis. But, you know, there's a reason why I believe Alex was 13 when he, when he went to home to be with the Lord. But there's a reason why when he's 11 and 12 years old, he's asking me to come to his house and talk to him about death and talk to him about heaven and talk to him about eternity. It's not many 10 or 11 year olds that want to have those conversations. You know why? Because the struggle changes you. And the Bible says that the man looked at Jacob and he says, you're not Jacob anymore. He says, from now on, you're going to be called Israel. The name of a person was the essence of who they were. He went from being a cheat and a thief and a schemer and a stealer to being a man who strove with God and found victory. Because on the other side of the, vic on the, other side of the struggle is victory. If you will hang in there and not quit, don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. Stay faithful. Keep serving the Lord because it's something that changes us. You say, well, how do I get blessing? There's so many verses in the Bible. So many verses in the Bible about if you want to be blessed, then do this. I just want to bring up three and I'm just going to mention them. The Bible says, if you want to be blessed by God, then you trust God. Trust him. Trust him no matter what. When things go wrong, trust him. When someone hurts you, trust him. When God doesn't make any sense at all. And there will be times when it doesn't seem like God makes sense. You know, you know what you do? Trust him anyway. Um, when people say the Bible's outdated, trust him. When people give you advice that goes contrary to what God wants you to do and how God wants you to live, trust him. You know, I always say, go with the one who would die for you. And I've told the illustration so many times, but the kid that called me at the church and he said, you know, I'm watching these YouTube videos about the, the Mayan calendar. This was back in 2012. And he says, I honestly believe at the end of December, this is it. You know, all of civilization is going to be gone because I'm watching these YouTube videos. And I said, what's your dad say about it? He said, my dad says, stop watching the YouTube videos. And I said, you know what I would do if I were you? I said, I would go with the one who would die for you because I will guarantee you, your father would lay his life down for you. That's how much he loves you. And this dude on YouTube doesn't even know you. Go with the one who would die for you. I say that about God. Why should I trust God? Because he became a human being. He came to this earth and he died on a cross for you. Go with the one who would die for you, who wants you to benefit more than anyone else. Jeremiah 17, seven says this, but blessed are those who trust in the Lord. You wanna be blessed in life? Trust the Lord. Put your hope in the Lord. Put your confidence in the Lord. Second thing is obey him. Obey him, obey him, obey him, obey him, no matter what, obey him. Another Old Testament story, Jacob's grandfather, Abraham. Abraham was told to take his only son, Isaac, who was Jacob's dad, and I want you to take him to the mountains of Moriah and I want you to sacrifice him as a burnt offering to me. You know what Abraham said? He said, say what? No, he didn't say that. He said, yes, Lord. I'll do exactly what you tell me to do. He had faith that him and his son were going to come back. He absolutely did. But he followed the instructions of the Lord. He obeyed him. One of the most powerful verses in the Bible is Genesis twenty-two sixteen 16 and 17. When God confronts Abraham after he made this incredible, lavish, radical act of obedience, 
And this is what God says to him. This is what the Lord says. Because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son. I swear by my name, my own name, that I will certainly bless you. I will bless you, Abraham. Why? Because you trusted me. Why? Because you obey me. You want, you want blessing in your life? I want it. I crave it. Obey him. When everything else is going haywire, obey God. When everybody else says you're a wacko, for listening and reading to and obeying and following the Bible, obey him anyway. Trust him and obey him. The, the third thing is stay away from the influence of wicked people. I know that not a lot of churches preach that, you know, but that's a pretty important thing. If you're going to read the book of Psalms, David wrote a lot of those Psalms. They're really songs. It's 150 top hits. Well, you know, the number one song, the first song, Psalm 1, the very first words of the first psalm written by David under the inspiration of God. This is what he says. He says, blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. That's what he says right out of the gate. First words. You know what? Um, I want you to love people. <laughs> Let me tell you, we're all sinners. Everybody's sinners. I'm not trying to encourage anybody to say, all right, they're the wicked people. We're the holy people. I'm not talking about that, you know, obviously. We're all sinners. The only difference between, you know, my sin and their sin, if a person doesn't know Christ, is my sin's been washed and put under the blood of Jesus. That's it. I had nothing to do with it other than faith in my Lord and Savior. That's, that's it. So that is a big difference, though. So what I'm saying is this. Absolutely, you, somebody seems to be wicked or evil or whatever it may be. You love them from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet. You do everything you can to influence them to Jesus. All I'm saying is this, don't get to the place where they influence you. That's all. You say, how do you know you get to the place? How do you know you've gone too far? How do you know they're influencing you more than you're influencing them? Well, look at the progression in Psalm 1-1. Blessed is the man who first walks. Initially, you may be willing to walk and see them, but walk by them. But then it may get to the place where you're now standing in the way of sinners. So you're not just walking past them. Now you're standing and having a conversation with them. And now you're not just standing and having a conversation with them, but now you're sitting with them and participating in whatever it is they're doing. And so there is a progression that takes place when somebody else influences us and draws us in. All I'm saying is this. Please understand something. We are in a struggle. And if, if I sin and ruin my life and ruin my marriage and, and ruin this minute, my ministry, you know, am I still going to go to heaven? Of course. I'm saved. I'm, Je I'm, I'm bought by the blood of Christ. You know, can, can God use me in prison? You know, can God put his hand on me wherever I am? Absolutely. But you know what? I'd rather have his blessing in another direction. Barry Black last weekend talked about the fact that two of his friends came up to him the day he memorized the verse that says, when sinners entice thee, do not go with them. He learned that verse that day. Two of his friends come to him and say, hey, let's go get even with a guy that did us wrong. Barry, at the risk of offending his friends, looked at them and said, I'm not going. Those two friends ended up killing that person that was against them. And both of those two people ended up spending life in prison. Here's a question. Do you think that Barry Black would have still gone to heaven even though he went to prison for life? Of course. Do you think God could have used Barry Black in prison? Absolutely. He could have been one of the most influential people in, 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 you know, on, I don't know what I'm saying, on death row maybe, or, or in prison for life. He could have been used absolutely. But you know what God's plan was for him? That he end up being an admiral in the Navy for 26 years and that he be the, chaplain for the United States Senate. You know what? I, I would rather God use me that way. You know, I want God to use me in any way he wants to use me. Absolutely. But I just, I just think that, you know, don't underestimate the power of choosing to trust and obey and stay away from wicked influence. Don't underestimate the power of God to use those things to bring a blessing and favor into your life that you never even dreamed possible. Do you think that Barry Black ever thought he would be an admiral in the Navy, raised by a single mother in poverty? Of course not. God had that plan for him. God had a blessing for him. God had a plan for his life. 
I mean, you're no different. The, 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 the steps are simple to follow, not always easy to do, but they're simple right there in the, in the, in the, you know, owner's manual to our life called the Bible. And so all I'm saying is God has a blessing for you. And it's most of the time it's on the other side of struggle. Let me just kind of close with saying that there's a powerful verse in the Bible when it comes to blessing. And they're all powerful, right? I mean, all the verses in the Bible are powerful, but there's this one verse that just is so amazing. And if you can kind of understand where it's, it's Numbers chapter six. Israel is in the place where they were 400 plus years in Egypt. That's all they knew for 400 years were Egyptian deities, you know, under the thumb of the Egyptians, slave labor, um, just, just, it was brutal. It was bad. So God heard their cries and delivered them. So two months from the time they left Egypt until the time they got to the base of Mount Sinai to happen, basically, there was a two-month period. They saw miracles that are crazy, crazy miracles. They saw God intervene and provide for them in ways that was amazing. So here they are now, camped at the base of Mount Sinai. They're not going to stay there two months. They're going to stay there two years. A lot of people don't realize that Israel camped at the base of Mount Sinai for two years. The first thing that happened was Moses went up on the mountain and he got the Ten Commandments. And you know what happened there. Actually, four main things happened. Moses gets the law, comes down and breaks them because everybody had broken the law. The people of Israel build an Egyptian deity. They go back to the god that was called Apis. Apis was the bull god in a very powerful god deity in Egypt. So what did they do? In a time of crisis, in a time of struggle, they said, I quit. I'm going back to what I know. I'm going back to another God. That's what they did. They built this golden calf. The, the third thing that happened was, is the priests were chosen because when Moses came down the mountain and he basically drew a line and he said, whoever's with the Lord, then c come to me. The Bible says that all of the Levites, all of them immediately, didn't even give it one thought. They all just went, <clears throat> They were all right with Moses. And that's probably when Moses said, okay, you're the priests, you know, or whatever. I know God chose them. But I think that was the time when that tribe was set apart to be God's priests, to represent the people to God, because they were willing to say, we're all in. We're not going this way. We're not following Apis. We're following the God of the universe. And Moses said, boom, I love that. I love that commitment. I love that decision. And then the fourth thing is that the, the tabernacle was built to complete specific, in, you know, to the, the exact specifics that God told them to build it. And then all of a sudden, at the end of the two years, the Shekinah cloud of glory, the presence of God was right there in this tabernacle that they had built. And the, the cloud would raise up and begin to move. And when the cloud rose up, that was the presence of God. They would begin to follow that cloud wherever it went. They would break camp and follow it. At the end of two years, the Shekinah cloud of glory raises up. They begin to follow it. But there's this section of numbers. It's 10 chapters right before they leave. At the, they're at the base of Mount Sinai. They get ready to, to break camp and leave. And then in chapter six, right in the middle of this section before they leave, you hear these verses. God says to Moses and Aaron, he says, I want you to bless the people and I want you to bless them this way. Verse number 22 says, the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you should bless the Israelites. Say to them, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. That's protection. That's him watching over you. May the Lord show his kindness. That's, that basically is him bending down to someone who is inferior to show kindness and care about them. He says, and, and have mercy on you. May the Lord watch over you. In other words, some versions say, put his face towards you. In other words, look at you. You ever have a conversation with somebody that won't look at you? You're, you're thinking, why am I even having this conversation right now? This person can't stand me. This person hates my guts. This person doesn't respect me or whatever. This is the God of the universe turning his face to you, to look at you, to pay attention to you. And the look on his face is one of joy, like you're mine. You belong to me. I accept you. I'm pleased with you. That kind of look. You know, sometimes you can get a look from, a, from another person that's just like, ooh, I don't think they're happy with me right now. You can say a whole lot with a look on your face. 
where God's face is directed towards you. You know what another word for that is? Blessing. He wants to bless you. The Lord watch over you and give you peace. That's welfare, that's prosperity. So Aaron and his sons will bless the Israelites with my name and I will bless them. You know what? That's what I want for, for me. That's what I want for you. That's what I want for this church. That's what I want for anybody that's watching. You know, wherever you may be, I want God's blessing on you. But I also want to warn you that to go after and crave and desire the blessing and the hand of God in your life is, is synonymous with, with entering into struggle and difficulty, but that struggle changes you. And on the other side of the struggle is blessing. On the other side of the struggle is favor. I say, hang in there and don't quit. What I wanted to do right now, we sing a song called The Blessing here. And, you know, the first time we sang it, I literally, I was standing out there. They were just practicing it. I'm standing out there, singing at the top of my lungs, tears coming down my face because it was a run-through. And I was just worshiping during the run-through. And I thought to myself, this is one of the most powerful songs that have ever been written, number one, because it's just quoting the scriptures and the scriptures are powerful. But number two, I think deep down we crave his blessing and we crave his hand on our lives. I want to have our worship band right now sing the song, The Blessing. And, and, and I just want you to listen to it or sing it out, scream it out, whatever. But listen to this song. It's the word of God, you know, in worship from our singing right into your heart. And I pray that, it, that it's a blessing to you. Choice. 
Amazing song, you know, and I think after a song like that, I think about two things. Number one, I think about people either need to rededicate or people need to be redeemed. You, need, you either need to rededicate your life to the Lord because you already know him and he's in your heart and you've given him your life and you're washed in the blood and you're saved and you're on your way to heaven, but you're far from him and you're not living your life in a way to have that blessing and have his hand and favor on your life. And today you want to make a decision to do that. You know what? I'm I'm gonna ask you to do something radical, you know? If you got your whole family with you, this may be awkward, but I just wanted to ask you maybe just to, if you're sitting on your couch or sitting somewhere, just to kneel down beside your couch as if you've come to an altar. And I want you just to rededicate your life to the Lord. I want you to basically just tell him, Lord, I'm sorry that I've been running from you. I want your hand upon my life. Yes, it's a struggle and it's something that I'm afraid of a little bit. But I know on the other side of the struggle is blessing. I know on the other side of the struggle is maturity and it's gonna change me. And I want that change in my life. So I want you to know that I rededicate my life and my heart and my family and everything to you. I want your hand on my life. I want your blessing on my life. If, if, if maybe you're here or listening and you've never been saved, you've never believed that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he came to this earth 2,000 years ago as God in the flesh, that he died on a cross for the sole purpose of redeeming you, purchasing you with his own blood. He purchased your soul by forgiving your sins, making you a part of his family. And all it takes on your part is faith, believing, just believe that he is who he said he was, that when he died, that wasn't the end because three days later he rose up. And because when we believe in him, we become in Christ. And when we're in Christ, we also basically, you know, take advantage of, of all of he was able to do, even though we're unable to do it ourselves. We're now dead to sin. We will now be risen again to live eternally. You know, we get the same blessings. And so I just want you to make a choice today if you need to be redeemed, to make a decision to believe in Christ and invite him into your life right now. And if you wanna do that, just tell him. Why don't you just pray this to your heavenly father? I want you to know that I, I believe by faith, not because I've seen, but because I believe by faith that Jesus died on the cross, that Jesus rose from the dead and that you did it all for me. And so I give you my life. All that I am, I give to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Listen, if you accepted Christ as your savior, please do me a huge favor and just 
let us know in the comments right now. You're like, whoa, that's a little bit much. Just let us know in the comments, you know? Maybe the hand clap if you got saved or, or whatever emoji you can do in the, in the comment section. I don't even know if you can do emojis or just type in the words, you know, you know, I'm in. I gave my life to Christ today or something. We also would like you to take your phone and text the words Park Valley to 97,000. We'll be able to get you some information in your hands and resources that will help you grow in Jesus. Also, if you need prayer for anything at all, just text the words prayer praise to 97,000 and we'll make sure that we pray over your, you know, prayer request for sure. So thank you. Thank you for being a part of the service. I know I probably preached a little bit longer than I should. And if you're still hanging in there, thank you. Uh, I know it's tough to do when you're watching TV or your computer or phone. Just know this, we love you. We are here for you. And if you need us for anything, you let us know. Um, have an awesome, awesome weekend.